our studios in the heart of Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, California. This is a CUBE Conversation. Hello everyone, welcome to this special CUBE Conversation here in Palo Alto, California. I'm John Furrier, host of the CUBE. We hear Fletcher Previn, who's the CIO of IBM, part of a series we're calling a new brand of tech leaders, where we profile leaders in technology and business, where there's innovation and a changing of the guard of approaches and results. Fletcher, thanks for uh, joining me today. Thanks for having me. So we were talking before we came on camera, you have an, uh, an interesting background. You kind of uh, went to uh, art school, got into entertainment as an intern, Conan O'Brien. Um, David Letterman. David Letterman. You're fast tracked to be a comedian and get into the business of entertainment <laughs> and you ended up as the CIO. How does that happen? Tell us the story. The comedy's better in tech. <laughs> <laughs> These days, and certainly watching, watching the Senate hearings, it's, it's phenomenal. Yeah, well, so uh, as you said, I thought I very well might go into entertainment. That's kind of more the uh, family business and uh, spent a lot of time on movie sets and worked as a production assistant uh, on a couple movies and then was an intern at uh, the David Letterman show and Conan during, uh, during college, but um, I did always have this strong other thread of really loving technology and being drawn into it. And um, first family computer was a Commodore 64, but my first real computer for me was a, the original Mac 128K. And um, I knew something was awry when, when I was working at the uh, Letterman show, I was kind of more interested in the phone system than who the guest that night was. And so uh, when I graduated, I just accepted it. Why keep fighting this? I'm going to go out to the West Coast and, yeah. and start my career in tech. It's interesting, you know, you always gravitate towards where your affinity is. I think a lot of people look at today's uh, work environments and environment where there's so many shifts and new kind of waves. I mean, to me, we've always said on theCUBE, you know, this wave that we're living on, tech wave, is kind of the combination of mainframe, mini computers, local area networks, and PCs all kind of rolled up in one because there's so many different um, touch points that's changing things. You got, you know, you don't need to be a coder to, to be successful in cybersecurity. You can be a policy person. Mm -hmm. A lot of societal changes with self-driving cars, which side of the street do they drive? All these new things are happening. And so it's really putting the pressure on digital and the notion of data. IT has become a central part of it. You're the CAO at IBM. How do you look at that world? Because now being a technologist, we'll get to the IBM in a minute, but the, the topics, but as a technologist, as someone who's Chief Information Officer, when you look at the world today, and you look at the wave we're on, what does the, the wave of technology mean to you? Yeah, well I think as you said, there is no part of our modern life that is not touched and hopefully augmented in some way by technology. And so, um, you know, that's the answer to the question, why am I at IBM, is because uh, the kinds of businesses that IBM is involved in, the kinds of enabling technology that it provides, um, really underlies a lot of the critical infrastructure and systems for our modern way of life. And so um, um, being able to be at a company that has a narrative position in what our collective future looks like is, uh, is, is what drives me. Yeah, a lot of the application developers, you guys have a huge portfolio uh, um, of, of applications. You got cloud computing, you got on-premise, you got IOT, a lot of things with AI changing. It's changing the nature of application development, but also the role of data. At IBM as the CIO, what is your strategy in, in, in looking at all these changes and how do you implement it with IBM? What is specifically your strategy? Well, certainly, um, you know, our strategy is there will be no part of the IT portfolio that is not augmented with IBM technology, and in particular, AI. And an AI strategy is a data strategy for us to be able to really um, collect, organize, harness the power of that data, and then leverage it in innovative ways um, to, to be a, a more effective, efficient business. Um, more broadly though, as if in terms of what is my strategy to deliver IT services to a huge uh, company of IT professionals, it's to lead with design. And um, you know, there's a lot underneath that, but one of the first changes that I made when I became CIO of IBM was adding as a direct report to myself, a person responsible for design and user experience. And um, you know, IBM's got a huge focus on design thinking and leading with the user experience, but uh, for us to be successful, we got to create an environment where successful, oh, excuse me, where talented people want to work. And um, that requires us to have empathy and engineer from the user in instead of IT out. And making service is a big part of it because you've got consumption, people consuming IT. Yeah, exactly. The barrier to entry for people to um, make decisions about what they use or don't use is very different. I think people coming to the business um, 10 years ago, very different set of expectation even five or three years ago. 
And so uh, it's, it's got to be carrot, it can't be stick. Um, people just won't do something because you tell them to do it. They have to perceive that this is uh, making their work life better in some way. Culture is a huge thing. I want to get your thoughts on engineering for excellence. This is something that uh, you believe in. What's your view on that? What does that mean? What does engineering for excellence mean for you as CIO? Yeah, well we spend a, a, a lot of time thinking of IT as a driver of culture change. And, uh, and when people say we're um, a culture that values engineering excellence, what does that really mean? Um, and it means that we recognize and reward people who are really passionate about what they do for a living, deep subject matter experts in their field. Um, you know, I sometimes get asked, what are you looking for when you hire people? And I'm looking to hire people who are kind, passionate about what they do for a living, and believe in our purpose as a company. And if we surround ourselves with those kind of people, we will be successful in whatever problem we happen to be trying to solve at that moment. What are some of the guiding principles in an organization that's engineered for excellence? What are some of the guiding principles that you hire and, and push forth through your organization? Yeah, I think it's, um, well, as I said, you know, the, 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 that we are trying to attract and retain and ultimately reward um, the people who are deeply passionate about what they do and uh, believe in our collective purpose. And so I think the era of the generalist is probably um, a bygone era. You know, I'm, 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 I'm looking to attract people that are doing in their spare time and in their hobbies and at home the same thing that we're paying them to do at work because they love it and they feel fulfilled by it. And the roles are changing too. Talk about the skills gap. This is a big talk track. We hear at every event we go to and executives we talk to, the, the new brand of tech leaders have to address the skill gap because there's more job openings in jobs that don't have a degree requirement, meaning this the job doesn't have a, a certificate or a diploma because it's new, whether it's cybersecurity right. or data science, new kinds of roles and the skill gaps there. What Talk about that, that challenge opportunity. Yeah, well these new and emerging fields, AI, blockchain, cloud or otherwise, um, you're right, a lot of those are new and there are not well-established uh, four-year degrees around those, those, uh, those kinds of professions. And so IBM is very heavily involved in what we call the P-TECH or the Pathway to Technology Program where um, people can have a successful career in technology without having a, a traditional four-year college degree. Um, but more broadly, yeah, there is a, there is a gap or a, a, you know, a gap between the demand and the supply for people in these fields. And so the best protection all of us have against obsolescence is continuous upskilling and education. And that happens organically if you're passionate about what you do because you're eating, breathing, and sleeping the, the area that you work in. Yeah, and sometimes learning learning on the job too is key, and using you know getting content on the internet, so people can self learn and, and apply that. Talk about how your organization is structured for learning. How do you retain the best talent? What are some of the strategies you deploy to keep people motivated, mm -hmm. keep them informed, and keep them um, engaged with a, and a good assignment? Yeah, well, that is a, a challenge in any large organization, and IBM is 350,000 plus people in 170 countries, and so the the era of us being able to get everybody together in a town hall meeting is is long gone. And so, how we communicate our our and get everybody on the same page around mission alignment, what is our strategy, um, and what skills do you need, and how do you stay informed and educated? That's uh, that's an ongoing challenge. Um, I think ultimately we try to attract people with. Um, our purpose as a company. It's an employer of purpose. Uh, the kinds of work that IBM's involved in attracts people that are mission driven. Um, and then there is a tremendous focus on providing um, uh, distance based self paced learning, online learning, in person learning, badging programs, the P Tech program that I mentioned, and to make sure that uh, a person who is motivated and wants to um, grow their skills and uh, that they have the uh, all the vehicles to do that. But I think the other thing I spend a lot of time focused on is does everybody in this organization have um, a good understanding of what our purpose as a company is and how what they do contributes to that purpose and can they map back really clearly, I'm not just a widget in a machine doing something and I have no idea what the impact of it is. I, I see w that what I'm doing contributes to our collective success. People want to work for a mission-driven company. That's a new tr data point we've been seeing. Yes. Talk about the outcome um, of focus. You know, you hear digital transformation being kicked around. I think it's happening now more than ever. Obviously, it's been hyped up, but now you're starting to see companies really digging in. You guys are going through a digital transformation over many years. You supply technology for companies that are transforming digitally. 
the notion of business outcomes becomes a big part of that. How have you uh, evolved your organization from an outcome standpoint that's new and different from the old ways? Can you give an example uh, and talk about that old way of doing things and the new way of doing things? How do you talk about you know, technology for business outcomes in a new way? Well, ultimately it's a business problem that you're solving. And so there has to be a business driver behind any project that, that we engage in. And um, having good discipline around, you know, organizations tend to die of indigestion, not starvation. And uh, getting really disciplined about what we say no to, in some cases is more important than what we agree to do. And it's much harder to stop work than it is to start work in a large organization. And so we've really leveraged Agile as a new way of working to say, we have a well-defined methodology for uh, one funnel of work that gets prioritized in partnership with the business in a transparent way where we say, you submit this many units of, of demand, we have this much unit of supply, let's go through the uh, story definitions, backlog grooming, yeah. feature presentations, retrospectives, the mechanics of working in an agile way to be really disciplined yeah. about, everyone's on the same page about what we are going to do and what we're not going to do. Yeah, that's a great point, we hear this all the time, certainly in Silicon Valley here where I'm located, the notion of agile, fail fast, a lean startup. You know, I never bought into the whole fail fast thing, <laughs> no one wants to fail, but yeah. in the spirit of learning, agile, Failure is a part of the process, so you know, getting to yes is what people want to get to, but you can't say yes to everything. IT has failed in that area, you can't say yes to everything. So you yeah. got to say no, yeah. and you got to also get to what you don't want to do. So knowing what is not the right way to go is where yeah. Agile kicks in. So Agile, you want to get to a fail point to know what not to do. At the same time, you got to say no to all the requests that you possibly need to do. Yes. Is, is kind of the formula. Talk about that dynamic, because this is a, uh, where Agile translates or DevOps translates into business. It's the same kind of concept applied to organizations, process, and people. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, in terms of how do we have good discipline around what we do and don't do, it's very important that people understand what their, what their role in the company is and what their lane is and what their mission is. And, and if we say no to something, it's not an indictment that that piece of work is not valuable. It just may not be, something that is aligned to our mission or something that we're supposed to do. And I think those things can get blurry if you don't have really well-defined uh, agile frameworks and ways of working and everybody on the same page. And so all kinds of things can sound like a good idea potentially, but if it's ultimately not really what we're supposed to be doing, that's what uh, creates friction, right? So I'd love to get your thoughts as uh, just as a, as a uh, person in tech who's got a lot of responsibility at IBM, but mm -hmm. you can talk about IBM from an IBM capacity or as a, as a person, but we have a lot of conversations here on theCUBE from Netflix to IBM to, to practitioners in the field around the role of data. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to be data driven. So there's no debate there. Data driven is a good approach to take on things. Yes. But how you look at data depends on what you're looking at. You can correlate data and you got causation. So a lot of conversation has been around, don't get too caught up in the data for the data's sake. Because if you look at just correlation, you might not know what's causing something. So most data science love correlation because it's numbers, they're there. You can look at, look at all this correlation, but not understand the cause of something. Can you talk about how you view this? Because this has become an important part of decision making mm -hmm. with data. Yeah, for sure. And AI very closely related to having a good data and data governance and taxonomy strategy to really be able to harness the insights from all of that data. You got to have a good data governance strategy behind it, but behind every piece of data is a business process. And so ultimately, being able to really map back and understand which business processes are generating this data um, is sort of the methodology for, for trying to wrangle some, um, you know, put your arms around all of the massive amounts of data that are being collected. And I think our old strategy was, we'll have a data lake and we'll just dump everything into it. Um, the advent of AI sort of requires a different data strategy and says, we need to have a good governance process around this and have a data platform, not a data lake, that we can then build automation against, uh, run AI against it, and um, be a business that makes better, more informed decisions based on that data, and then help our customers do the same thing. And this has certainly come up a lot in AI around bias and contextual relevance. It's a big part of yeah. what's behind the data. Right, and you, and you need to have explainability and transparency into the uh, recommendations that AI is making. Uh, you know, if it's a black box, that, that's an issue. If, if AI came back and told you, I think uh, you should make your product more expensive, your first question would be, why? And if you can't answer that. And so, um, AI is a, a 
autonomous driving is a good example of that, where you put a human being in the, in the seat and he or she drives the car, and then the system compares the inputs that they would make versus what the human is doing and, and can explain why they had uh, variances. But if it's just a complete mystery, that's, that's yeah. not going to work. The contextual and why is a great question. I want to get your thoughts on, on um, security, mm -hmm. but you had made a comment earlier around the general purpose IT person is kind of a thing of the past, meaning that specialism and or variety and diversity of skills are always going to be out there. Yeah. With security, no one company has the same security makeup because their posture and or their organization structures are different because their organization mm -hmm. mission is different. No yeah. one company is the same. It's kind right. of like our, our, we as individuals, DNA, everyone's different. So mm -hmm. that means that security is not always the same in every company. As a CIO at IBM, you guys are a large multinational, you're right. actually huge. Other companies might have different approaches. How do you see security playing out? Because in some cases, CIOs manage security, some cases the CISO is bolted out separately. Right. Either way, we know security is a board issue, yes. as is IT. Right. What's your view on security and the role of security within an organization? Security is a huge focus for us. It consumes a, a large amount of my time, and as much as we worry about our data, we really worry about customer data. And um, the kinds of threats that we're seeing are evolving rapidly. And as an industry statement, I would say the advantage continues to go to bad guys, not good guys. Red is easier than blue. And so this really becomes an exercise in do we understand our networks and the systems that underlie those networks better than the people who are trying to break into it? And in particular, some of the more um, you know, apex predator, advanced nation state activities. Uh, in terms of the organizational construct of CISO and where it fits in the, in the company, we've, we've had different models. Uh, where we're at today is that the CISO is a peer of mine and we work very closely together. And the CISO really, um, for the most part, defines risk and understands what is the attack surface and threat profile of any particular area. And then anything operational uh, falls to the IT department. And so in, in our environment, you know, IBM's 350,000 plus employees. The IT department that I lead is about 12,000 people. Um, and so we have to work very closely together on um, very different threat profiles of general back office workers, people building commercial software, researchers building quantum computers, people doing outsourced IT. All of them have very different security yeah. profiles and we have to be able to meet those requirements for each of those segments. We could do a whole hour just on security, one of my favorite topics, but you guys do have a large surface area. Yes. You got a large employee base, diverse virtual workforce and offices. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you got applications. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a really complicated security framework you guys have. Well, not framework, but just in terms of challenge, opportunity. It's a, it's a large uh, surface area. Uh, hopefully the framework is not <laughs> complicated, but um, it does require vigilance and focus. And so as an example, I am a customer of IBM's X-Force and managed security services. IBM's a uh, market leader in the um, security services business, and they're my kind of perimeter defense on yeah. some of these things. But um, but no, you're right. It's it's a um, um, it's something that we are we can't take our focus off of. You know, I had a conversation just recently with General Keith Alexander, formerly the yeah. original com uh, commander of um, Cyber Command. Mm -hmm. Now he's a CEO of a startup uh, doing similar kind of a, a, a private version of NSA. Signaling is huge in security, and I know yeah. your um, uh, uh, one of your hobbies is to study kind of like the, the general national security thing as, as, as the techie. Mm -hmm. The enterprise is, they're private organizations. You know, the government's job is to protect IBM. <laughs> but you guys have to protect yourself. So you have a new world now where there's a private public partnerships going on where signaling is a super important. Where's the data coming from real time? And yeah. sometimes systems can slow that down in the sake of protecting, but at the same time you need real time, not just for security, but in business retail to users. The real time has become a big part of it. What's your thoughts on the notion of real time and, and security? It's huge because our um, capacity to detect, respond, and remediate threat in real time or as near real time as we can is the name of the game. And um, um, you, you're exactly right. They're, they're the partnership between um, governments and public sector and private sector I think um, is evolving in a positive way where we're beginning to see, um, as an industry statement, more of these kind of um, advanced nation state type tactics even being used outside of, of governments. And so that requires a different kind of response. And then we got to kind of move forward from 
uh, an environment where things that are publicly avail available get enriched and analyzed some way and then become classified and we can't have access to it. And so the kind of information sharing between companies and, and governments is really helpful in being able to detect threat on the internet in a, in a real-time way. And by the way, if, if you think we got threats now, when you get to AI and then eventually quantum, threat in the future is not going to be about getting you to click on a link in your email that you think is a legitimate email and install some piece of malware. It's going to be about injecting the minimum amount of data required to teach a system something incorrect or different. So if you think of uh, image classifi uh, classification in autonomous driving, with a very small piece of data, you can teach it that a stop sign is a yield sign. And that's a fairly kind of benign use case or a simple okay. one, but now imagine financial systems, healthcare yeah. systems. So that is leading to quantum resistant cryptography, which is how long do you need to retain data and then what is your encryption strategy around it. Yeah, it's interesting, the concept of malware injection can be applied to anything with this. So I got to ask you, because you guys are leading a lot in quantum, Bob Picciano, and I've had many conversations, you guys got a great group over there, you got power, amazing stuff happening in quantum. Quantum does change security. What specifically should people know about when they hear quantum? Good for security, potentially harmful for security, I see you, 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 it's an opportunity in both ways. You have a quantum computer, you can crack things much faster. Yep. The notion of passwords pretty much goes away, so I need you know, multi-factor authentication. I mean, the whole world's changing with quantum. What's your view? Well, like all technology, it can be leveraged for uh, good, or, good or, or, or less good, and it's a reflection of what the human beings who are using that technology intend to do with it. Uh, at IBM, we are working on both sides of that issue. We're developing quantum computers, and then on the other side of it, developing encryption methodologies that are quantum resistant or quantum proof. So things like lattice cryptography, where you can, you can mathematically prove you can hide keys in n number of layers such that even a quantum computer can't decrypt it. And so then, how long do you really need to keep that data? If it's two or three years, maybe quantum resistant cryptography is less of, a, of an issue for you. If you are the Social Security Administration and you got to keep data for the next 50 years, uh, you got to start investing now in what does the quantum future look like and what are the implications to me from a data and encryption perspective. Quantum, super exciting. Fletcher, thanks for coming on and sharing your insight. Final question for you. As uh, a person in the tech industry, you're, you're, you've had a chance to see the waves um, and you got a big one coming up from quantum to cloud to AI. What are you most excited about? What should be, people be paying attention to in terms of the macro trends? Not necessarily just IBM, just your personal view of to be a new brand of tech leader, what are some of the things that people should pay attention to and what are you excited about? Well, what I'm excited about is um, what all of this technology is going to bring to bear on, on our lives. I mean, autonomous driving is going to be life-changing for, for people. Um, the insights that AI will derive. And think about how much time all of us spend doing menial, non-value-added tasks at work and in our personal lives. And those things will, um, we'll, we won't have to worry about as much with RPA and AI and, and on all kinds of technologies. And I think that will free us to be more creative and be more fulfilled and, and, and I feel very optimistic about the future. In terms of, uh, second part of your question, what, what advice would I have for tech leaders? I, I think it's, um, uh, you know, do what you're passionate about, yeah. and uh, and I spend a lot of time focused on um, trying to create an environment where I think talented people want to work, and that means understanding our purpose, communicating that purpose well, and um, um, you know, as I say, <laughs> kind, passionate about yeah. what you do, and believe in the company's yeah, that's purpose. Interesting, you mentioned tech for good. There's always a, a underbelly in every new trend, and. If you look at what happened, like say Facebook, I mean, we were talking in 2012 around how data could be weaponized. That was years before so-called election or other things meddling. Yeah. I think there's a community obligation from sharing data for security risks to seeing the good as a vision, but also identifying bad actors that are going to weaponize the good first, right? There's always, you have the, you always have those kind of early adopters, might not be the best characters. So there's a kind of a community, uh, has to come together and, and be faster to identify those. Yeah, I do think all of us as leaders have an obligation to um, understand that risk and then make decisions around, we as the designers of these systems have to make sure that we're engineering them with fairness and, and without bias and, you know, um, um, and then are the people that we're consuming technology from, are the people creating that technology are their business models compatible with the people who are consuming that technology and making decisions around yeah. who is an ethical, trustworthy partner that I want to be in business with to uh, develop the future? 
Fletcher, thanks for coming on. CIO of IBM here inside theCUBE as part of this special program, new brand of tech leaders. I'm John Furrier, thanks for watching. Thank you.